Schwab Advisor Services is proud to support the RIA Edge podcast and equally proud to support independent financial advisors like you. In a challenging year, how did 68% of firms surveyed in Schwab's RIA benchmarking study meet or exceed their new client goals? By following key success factors, such as leveraging new technology, adapting strategies to win new business and stay connected with their clients, while also attracting and developing the right talent. The Schwab RIA benchmarking study is just one of many ways they provide you with the insights and resources needed to succeed and grow. Get the full picture at advisorservices.schwab.com. Hello and welcome to RA Edge. I'm Mark Bruno, the Managing Director of the Wealth Management Group at Informa Connect. And thank you very much, everybody, for joining us here today. I am very, very excited to have our guest here today, Jeff Pierce, who's the CEO and the Principal of Whipfly Financial Advisors. Not only is Whipfly one of the fastest growing and most interesting, quite frankly, RA firms in the industry, Jeff and I actually used to work together for a hot minute at Investment News back in 2010, 2011. So Jeff, thank you for joining us. And it's really nice to reconnect with a fellow Investment News alumni. Yeah, thanks for having me, Mark. And uh, like you said, great to reconnect and uh, relive some of those old memories from the early 2010, 11 days. And reliving memories will be a very data-driven experience as we both spent you know, time working on the benchmarking studies over the years. And I'm glad to see that continue you know, for you. And I think a lot of it is now probably being applied on a very regular basis to how you think about Whipley and the growth there. Um, I think we have a lot to talk about. It's been an exciting year for you, I'm sure. Uh, I know you crossed the $5 billion in assets under management platform. Congratulations. I know you also recently announced your first acquisition. Congratulations again. So we'll definitely get into all of that. Uh, but before we do, I think, Jeff, it would be great to just start with you know, a little bit of an overview of Whipley financial advisors, um, and a, a little bit of a history on how the company's evolved and some of the things that you've done since joining in 2018 as CEO. So with that, Jeff, I'll turn it over to you. Can you tell us a little bit about Whipley Financial Advisors, please? Yeah, definitely. So Whipley Financial Advisors, as, as you said, Mark, we crossed the $5 billion mark earlier this year. So we're sitting at about five and a quarter billion. We are headquartered out of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and we are affiliated with Whipley, which is a top 20 public accounting firm in the US. We've got offices in 17 different locations uh, with staff in each of those locations, definitely leading with a client first mentality and surrounding them with all the expertise that not only Whipley Financial, but Whipley can bring to that as well. And I can tell you when I accepted this opportunity to join a CPA affiliated wealth management firm. You know, many of the, the folks that I've worked with over the years throughout the industry made me very aware of the challenges that would come with that. We see that oftentimes with these CPA affiliated firms that there's uh, different visions, different views of how we should think about the firm and build the firm and service clients. But can tell you just from the success that we've had over the past couple of years and the momentum that we're seeing within Whipley Financial We've we found what I feel is is a really good recipe for success in terms of collaboration and putting aside any challenges or differences that an accounting firm and a wealth management firm have in working together and really being able to drive strong organic growth and present our way our, ourselves in a, a very successful way as well through an inorganic growth strategy and attract other firms to what we're doing here. Excellent. I appreciate that. And I definitely want to talk about both the organic and inorganic side of things. I think there's a lot that our audience can learn from you and all that you've accomplished in you know, the couple of years that you've been with the firm. Before we do though, I also, I've noticed that you've made several strategic hires at the firm since coming on board. Would you mind just giving an overview of some of the roles that you've created and added since you've joined and you took the helm as CEO and also what the intent was behind some of those positions? Yeah, one of the first key things that I did when I got here in, in 2019 was really wanted to get a sense of what do we have in place today. And one of the things that I quickly recognized was that we did not have someone necessarily overseeing what we call our backstage or our back office groups. And so while it's a position many firms have, especially firms of our size, we didn't have a chief operating officer that was really leading those teams. And so that was one of the key first ones that was actually an internal promotion uh, with Jandy Rowe, who was overseeing our client service team. And so that really helped orchestrate all of the back office teams that we have, which includes our operations team, our client service team, uh, our investment team overall. 
And it helped uh, make sure that those teams were connected. It helped drive consistent processes across our 17 different locations, which can certainly present challenges in itself. But making sure that that back office is empowered and the ones driving consistency from office to office to drive that consistent client experience overall. So that was one of them. Uh, another one that we just recently hired and added to the team was a head of advisor success. We're really excited about this role. Uh, Craig Bartlett joins us with about 25 years of, of industry experience out of our as our head of advisor success. And you know, a lot of people were asking, you know, what, what is that role? What does that type of title mean? And what's the purpose of it? And the best way I can describe it, Mark, is he is accountable for the success of each and every one of our advisors. We have about 65 of them today. Uh, he has a vested interest in every single one of their development as an employee and success as an advisor, either servicing existing clients or, or uh, developing new business relationships. So uh, best way to kind of really think of that, I talked about Jandy as our chief operating officer overseeing the backstage side of things. Craig oversees the front stage side of things or our client facing our advisory teams overall. So those have been two real critical positions. And that way we've got someone that's accountable for that client facing piece of the business, as well as the, the more behind the scenes piece of the business. And those two work very, very closely together as we think about pursuing our vision and strategy overall. I appreciate so I, that. that. Yeah. It's very helpful just because I think the way you're looking at you know, the division of labor, right? Internal, external ownership to some extent. Yeah, you're larger than most RIA firms. But I think it's just an important distinction. You know, we've seen in you know, the staffing compensation studies uh, for years, the larger firms, one of the most commonly added or created positions was a COO, especially if it was a firm over a billion. Um, and I've heard a little bit more from firms of your size about these types of advisor success or even chief growth officer roles, depending on the size and the ambition of the of the firm. So thank you for sharing and giving some insight into that. Appreciate it. And I think it will be very helpful for our audience as they're thinking about ways to be more efficient and have more ownership and accountability, um, some human capital strategies that they can put in place. Um, you know, with that too, I definitely want to make sure you just announced your first acquisition and I believe it is slated to close at the end of the year or by the end of the year, but I'd love to get into a little bit more detail there. Uh, Jeff, would you mind one, before you even did the deal, you know, just giving us some insight into what your viewer, your know, M&A strategy in general is. And then two, what was it about this particular acquisition of Redwood that made for a perfect fit? Yeah. So Redwood Wealth Management uh, out of Alpharetta, Georgia and Atlanta suburb, they're our first acquisition, as you said, Mark, will be closing that deal uh, at the end of this calendar year overall. As we've thought about acquisition within our business, this is our first one. Uh, we hope it's the first of many, but it's not simply a, a land grab or going out there acquiring assets. We certainly are focused much more on that people first acquisition strategy. And it's not just one or two key employees or a rainmaker. We're really looking top to bottom in an organization and looking for really solid, good talent overall that are additive to our team. And that's been very important for us because what we recognize as a business is without good people, we have very little to offer to clients. And so we want to take very good care of our team. We want to add people that believe in everything we can do for our clients, believe in our mission, believe in our vision, and want to operate in that team environment, in that collaborative environment, and uh, would say that we truly operate that way. So as we go out there and look at these potential candidates, we want to make sure they're certainly in the right marketplace. Uh, but in, in addition to that, we want to make sure that they're leaning in, that they're buying in, and that it's not necessarily one of those sell and, and exit the business type strategies overall. Mm, definitely. And, and I'm curious when you look at, you know, you mentioned talent, we just hosted our very first RI Edge valuation and M&A workshop. And one of the comments that stuck with me uh, that coming out of the event was it was a presenter who mentioned it's easier right now in wealth management to acquire talent than it is to hire talent. There's just so, there's a shortage of talent out there and so much competition. Yeah. How true is that just in your experience in general, maybe not specific just to the Redwood deal, but I mean, is that, a, is that observation consistent with something that you're experiencing right now as well? We certainly are. You know, we're predominantly based in the Midwest. We do have offices in the Rockies as well as uh, now getting down in the Southeast and everything. But we're seeing that every single market that we're in, 
trying to go out there and hire talent, it is certainly a challenge. And I would say it's not necessarily a challenge to get resumes in the door and to have conversations with them. You know, an area that's near and dear to my heart and yours, Mark, is, is you mentioned the benchmark studies that we've both done over the years uh, throughout the industry. We are continually seeing the compensation side of things race up. And it, it's getting very competitive from that point of, of looking at the industry and thinking about what that is. And, and oftentimes hiring, if you find a good person and you're interviewing, they're likely talking three, four, five other firms and they are, they're in the driver's seat, the candidate yeah. is. And so oftentimes through that acquisition strategy, you can find just as good a talent that's not necessarily proactively looking, uh, but you can bring them into your business through a different approach, different angle which gets you that same good talent you would hope to find out there if you put a job posting up, but they're integrated into the business you're buying. They know the processes, they, they know the clients already, so they don't have as much of a learning curve, uh, which certainly benefits all parties involved. Yeah, and I, I'm also just you know, interested to learn a little bit more about what M&A looks like moving forward for you. You mentioned, and hopefully this is the first of many, uh, obviously it's been a very active period of M&A for the last few years, um, last year and this year in particular. As you look at 2022, what are some of the things that you're looking at from an M&A perspective? And also, what are some of the things outside of just the, the human capital um, and the talent, some of the things that you do look for when you're evaluating an acquisition opportunity? Yeah, beyond the talent side, you know that's certainly top priority. But looking beyond that, uh, as I've, I've mentioned, we are affiliated with an accounting firm. We sit today in about a third of their geographic footprint. So that's a big focus of ours as well, is where's the opportunity is where we can continue to take this collaborative service approach that we're doing with our clients today. How can we introduce that to other markets overall? So looking at a footprint standpoint, I think another big thing that is unique out there and, and hopefully will be beneficial for your, your listeners, Mark, is you don't have to be the top dollar, the top bid that's out there. You know, you really got to understand what is the seller's intent? What are they looking for? And that's important for us to fully understand. And it, it takes some time. It takes some commitment to have a lot of conversations to uncover ultimately what, what that seller is looking for. But ideally, we're looking for people that are going to lean into it. But also, what else are they looking for beyond just a, 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 some type of maybe potential liquidity event or joining a larger firm? And what oftentimes we're seeing through the conversations we're having Advisors want to take care of their people. They recognize that they've got good talent and, and they want to make sure that they're giving them opportunities. And if you're operating in a, a small to mid-sized firm, you might not be able to offer the same career paths and areas of focus and allow people to be a, a subject matter expert like they might be passionate about doing. So that's it's certainly a big area overall. Obviously, uh, streamlining through efficiencies and processes and having that centralized back office I described earlier is another key thing. A lot of acquisition targets that are out there, they haven't built that yet. It comes at a cost. It comes at an investment, just like hiring a, a COO or a head of advisor success. It is a big leap of faith that you're going to bring the right person in, that you're you're going to see the business case play out as you had intended it to. It compresses margins in the short run, but it goes a long way uh, in the long run if you get it right. And being able to have that, that platform that's set up there overall. And then another big piece is growth. You know, I think a lot of firms right now, if we look over the past 10 to 12 years, the market has been very strong. And as a result of that, if you start stripping your growth down and start looking at an X market, a lot of advisory firms who historically may have grown 8, 10, 12% are now growing somewhere between 2 and 6% most commonly. And many of them are trying to figure out how do we get back to that, that double digit growth X market through organic strategies and that's something, you know, through the right partnerships, we've got the benefit of being affiliated with an accounting firm and have, have figured out how are we effectively collaborating with the accounting firm to drive that growth overall. That's going to be critical to every firm's success is you can't just simply rely on client referrals anymore. Just like we instruct many of our clients to diversify their portfolio and their asset allocation, we as advisors have to diversify our, our growth channels as well. And I definitely want to get into that in more detail in a moment, but I just have one more question on the M&A side first. As you look at M&A opportunities and see not just what you're focused on, but what's happening in the industry, um, you hear it all the time, right? That the valuations are at an all-time high. Some people use the word bubble. Some people are saying it's a buyer's market or others are saying it's a seller's market. 
no shortage of opinions on where we are in this pretty unbelievable M and A period for the RIA industry. Where do you think we are, though, and how would you describe the M and A environment right now? Yeah, you know, depending on the numbers that you look at, it's it's somewhere between let's say seventeen thousand and thirty thousand independent RAs that are out there. My opinion is that's still way too many. And we've all seen the stats around the aging advisor base overall. So we're, we're going to see some natural compression just from retirements. But you mentioned higher valuation. You're, you're spot on. A lot of people are looking at that and see dollar signs. And so there's natural consolidation just because they can't turn down the offers that are getting uh, put on the table in front of them overall. If I had to put a, a wager out there or, or look at my crystal ball, Mark, I would say, you know, I'm going to use the, the 17,000 independent REAs that I view as, as really who were out there uh, as our peer firms. That's probably about 15,000 too many. You know, it, it's going to go somewhere much less than where we are today. I would say we're going to see a lot of that occur probably over the next eight, 10, maybe 12 years overall. But it's going to result in some super large uh, national players that are emerging. We're already seeing some emerge overall. Yeah. We're going to see the regional players that are out there too. But we're going to see much more squeeze from a client experience and talent experience standpoint uh, or employee experience standpoint that the small players just aren't going to be able to remain relevant and competitive. And, and so they, they've got to figure out, do I invest and, and grow through bringing on some overhead? Uh, do I partner up with the firm or do I ride this out as long as I can, recognizing that there might not be a real long-term future? Yeah, it'd be very interesting to see what happens, right? There are so many different contributing factors, whether it's you know, the demographics, capital that's coming in into the space right now. But it, it's an interesting time to be sitting in your seat and mine, for that matter, as well. W- with that, I definitely want to talk a little bit about some of the organic growth that you've had as well. Um, I mentioned before, across the $5 billion in assets under management threshold. Um, I'd be curious, for one, since you joined, you know, where have you seen most of that, that growth come from? Um, and then how have you been sort of intentionally you know, continuing to accelerate that growth and lean in where it makes the most sense? Yeah, a couple of big things that we've been focused on. One was strengthening the relationship with the accounting firm. Uh, our business has been around since 1999. We launched Wealth uh, at a similar time in the late 90s, like many other public accounting firms did, and had some early years of success. And, and then there was some difference of views and opinions and, and visions. And ultimately, our firm went through a split back in 2018. And through that whole process, there was some friction with the accounting firm. You know, it's it's not uncommon to see. CFPs duke it out a little bit with CPAs of, of the workload and, and, and the, the wealth that someone can generate in working in one of these businesses overall. So a big focus was coming in and I brought my consulting background, my research background and took it, the opportunity to help educate the accounting firm and understand what is the, what's the opportunity that's in front of us? What's the opportunity in front of us for their clients that they work with and how can we work and partner together more effectively? So that's been a big piece of it. When I got here, we had about one and a half percent mutual client penetration. Uh, If we look at it today, it's it's about three percent, a little north of three percent. And the nice thing is that we're seeing that momentum increase. It seems like each and every day, overall. And a big part of that is is recognizing that these clients have needs that extend beyond their tax work, or if they're a business owner, and we might be supporting their business entity. At the end of the day, they're an individual as well. And so they've got needs on that individual side of things. So uh, really just bringing, rather than relationships being one-to-one, surrounding them with all the people that we can service and support these clients with, they might not consume a service uh, that day, but at least there's that awareness factor. And just by creating awareness, we're seeing a lot more clients come back to us and say, hey, a few months ago when we talked about that, you mentioned that you've got a wealth management group. Can we explore that a little bit more? So that's been a big focus. The other big one uh, that we rolled out back in 2020 was uh, we rolled out what we call our advisor business plans. And our advisor business plans were created really off a a single conversation that I had with one of our advisors here in Wisconsin. And and he told me what his goal was for the year. And I asked him how he was going to get there. And his comment at that time was, I'm going to try a lot of different activities. And at the end of the year, hopefully I hit whatever my revenue goal is. And so that's great. It's, a, it's an approach. It's a style, but it, it's not really a focus approach. And you're trying a lot of different things. And at the end of the year, how are you going to know which one was successful and which wasn't? So through these advisor plans uh, and a series of questions that we ask each of our advisors, 
getting them focused. And it's not just quantitative. It's not just qualitative. There's a nice balance there, but helping them hone in on which clients do they enjoy working with the most, whether it's a common hobby, it's a common profession, it's a common employer, whatever it is, and, and giving them the time to think about that, take a step back, evaluate today's current client base that they're working with finding those common traits and themes, and then building that plan around that so that when they are doing their activities for the year, they're doing it with the types of clients and prospects that they want to build a business around. And that uh, just laser focus approach that we've had over the past two years has really seen a lot of benefits and, and has accelerated our growth overall. Well, congrats on that. I, I know you mentioned the piece on the accounting side, the, you know, the crossover the penetration rate doubling. Um, I'm curious, you know, being at 3% now, how does that sit with you relative to what you think the actual potential might be just out of curiosity? Yeah, we certainly recognize we're never going to get up to a hundred percent. I talk with our managing partner on a regular basis on the accounting firm, and we would really like to see that number get to 10%, but I'm confident we'll be able to get it to 20% over the, the years ahead. Yeah, I appreciate it. I asked the question just because I mentioned our m a workshop um, last week. And one of the topics that came up was just how some of the firms in the room you know, can leverage the access that they have to participants in the 401k plans that they're advising. Um, so it brings up this notion of you know, the opportunities that exist when there are these convergence points, right? We already have a connection and some sort of relationship with you know their financial uh, and individual's financial lives. So this just kind of sits in that same camp. Um, so looking forward to seeing how things continue to progress al along those lines for you all as well. Uh, I think we have just about touched on you know, everything that was on my list here today. And I appreciate you taking as much time as you have to share a little bit of insight, not only into your M&A strategy, but the organic growth side of things. Before we let you run, Jeff, is there anything else if you're, you know, if you have the ability to sit down with one of our listeners who's you know, thinking about how do I get from 250 million in assets to 500 million or from 500 million to a billion, are there any other final closing thoughts that you would give for that individual on how they could drive some more intentional growth? Yeah, the biggest piece of advice I would give there, Mark, and again, this goes back to the, the many years of researching our industry and being a student of our industry advisors tend to be a bit risk averse when they're thinking about the, the future of their firm and how they're going to grow and how they're going to invest into it. And there is a, there is a leap of faith element to it. And uh, I can tell you if, if it feels right in your gut, you got to take a chance. You got to give a shot at it and, and invest in those things, you know, hiring that, that first kind of director of operations or chief operating officer role mm -hmm. or reevaluating your technology, just making that investment. Does it compress margins in the short run? Absolutely, it does. But you're doing it as a long-term play to stay relevant out there. And that's critical. And it, it can be scary, uh, especially when you're an owner in the business and, and you're writing those big checks and you're thinking about, well, what's this mean for the future? And what's it mean for me personally? If you take that risk, you know, I, I've seen it. Uh, I've seen too many firms not take the risk and, and end up struggling and failing. And I've seen a lot of firms that have taken the risk and, and they're now, you know, two, five, 10 times larger than they were when I was talking with them a handful of years ago. So don't be afraid to go out there on a limb and, and give it a shot every once in a while. That's a great piece of, an advi of advice and a perfect place to wrap here. So Jeff, thank you so much for stopping by RA Edge. It's nice to connect again. Hopefully, won't be another 10 years, right? Uh, in between <laughs> conversations here, uh, but we'll have to have you back on very soon. So thank you so much for joining us here. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate the time. And thank you to our audience here for joining us in another episode of RIA Edge. Hope you found this to be very valuable, very informative. We'll be sure to reconnect with Jeff in the near future and watch Wifley's progress as it builds its firm and its organization across 2022 and beyond. Until then, again, thank you very much for joining us. I'm Mark Bruno, Managing Director at Informa Wealth Management, and we look forward to having you all back on another episode of RIA Edge soon. Schwab Advisor Services is proud to support the RIA Edge podcast and equally proud to support independent financial advisors like you. In a challenging year, how did 68% of firms surveyed in Schwab's RIA benchmarking study meet or exceed their new client goals? by following key success factors such as leveraging new technology, adapting strategies to win new business and stay connected with their clients, while also attracting and developing the right talent. The Schwab RIA benchmarking study is just one of many ways 
They provide you with the insights and resources needed to succeed and grow. Get the full picture at advisorservices.schwab.com.